Every time we now travel to one of these amazing places, it is both glorious and an absolute tragedy, Mm -hmm. right? And this trip had this sort of bittersweet aspect to it. Not only the lionfish, of which we only saw one, which is pretty good, um, but there was also this thing which we have now seen in so many places, especially in the Caribbean, which is every one of these absolutely spectacular beaches, at least on the ocean side, every single one of them is just filled with things that have washed up out of the ocean. Right. And we're talking about, you know, plastic carboys, uh, flip flops. I saw medical waste. And at some level, Mm -hmm. you know, I think, A, it's interesting. The people who go to these places, including us, have the reaction of like, oh, my goodness, I tell you what, I'll bring a trash bag. We'll we'll at least do something, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's pointless, right? The amount of material washing out of the ocean is so great that there is just no making a dent. But you know, everybody has this reaction of like, oh my god, I can't believe. At least let I'm, me do something, right? I'm looking mm-hmm. at one of the most beautiful vistas I've ever seen, and it's compromised. If I, you know, I in order to take a picture that I want to look at again, I'm going to have to place myself very carefully. You know, there's a tire, there, you know, whatever it may be, and so. This is just a classic externality, right? Mm -hmm. This is an externality Mm -hmm. of the way we live. We have chosen materials that are cheap. We have chosen to dispose of them in ways that result in them not being captured and dealt with appropriately. Some of these materials are not permanent. They will break apart. The plastics are all breaking apart in the sun, but unfortunately we now know what they break apart into is microscopic dust, which gets into all of our uh, lungs and into yeah. the, all of the animals and, you know, things are differentially tolerant of it, but it's yeah. a tragedy. We are effectively wrecking the planet. And, you know, because we'd never been to the Bahamas before, we are in no position to compare it to how it was. And this but, is, this is one of the questions we were asking each other, right? What did, what did this place look like a hundred years ago? Right. And we don't know. We don't know. And I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if that has been recorded. Presumably it has somewhat, but, but, the problem is that where we are in a position to compare, even over relatively short time spans, there is often a horror story hidden, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, let's take the trash example. Most of the places that we go are now compromised in this way, but you and I know a few places where this isn't true, right? In the Amazon at Tipitini, for example, it is very rare that you encounter anything. I I believe the most prominent example of trash that had come in from the outside world is a piece of dimensional lumber that had lodged in the river, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty mild at that point. Yeah. You don't, uh, upstream, uh, you know, the source of the rivers in the Andes is not generating trash that is at least that's making it down to the the Rio Tipitini or the Rio Shirapuno or, or the Napo. So, on the one hand, from the point of view of visual indicators, it seems more like it's untouched. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, over the period of time you and I have been going there, which is, you know... At this point, nine years? Nine years, not quite a decade. We have seen certain kinds of animal life disappear, and inexplicably in some cases. It used to be that you could go out at night and you could reliably find caiman in the Tipitini River, mm-hmm. right? You would, and it, there's a trick. You use a headlamp. It's mounted on your head. The animals look at you because you're emitting light, and you can see the shine from their eyes. And it was like, uh, it was relatively easy to find caiman. You could probably find oh, 20 in an hour yep. uh, of boating. Didn't see one last time. That's pretty amazing. That that the uh, didn't see any. I didn't see any. I was looking for them. Um, and I was looking for them, you know, in part, I was looking for them as a photographer, looking for, you know, I'd learned from the photo- yeah. photographs I'd taken the last time and I wanted a, 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 a redo, right? I wanted mm-hmm. a rematch and just didn't see it, right? Yeah. That's amazing to see a spectacular, it's not like we saw half as many and we were wondering. Yeah. And that's not a, a, that's not a species that we would think of as being particularly fragile. Right. Why should it be? Yeah. Right. It's a crocodilian. It's a right. small crocodilian. It's a small crocodilian. It's pretty yeah. robust. It's not going to be highly sensitive to slight changes in temperature of the river. Probably what it means is that the things that it eats in the river, which are very likely to be fish, have 
crashed, yep. right? And that we don't see that because the river is muddy. We can't see the fish, but yeah. we can see the, the, the caiman. Yeah, the muddy, the muddy, the, the Rio Tipitini, uh, which is a tributary of a tributary of tributary of the Amazon, uh, is what's called a whitewater river uh, in, in the Amazon basin, of which there are whitewater rivers and blackwater rivers. So whitewater doesn't mean the same thing as like, you know, having a lot of rapids. Whitewater refers to the amount of silt, uh, which is coming basically off of glacial melt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, the, the water is not clear. It is the opposite of the water in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. in fact. And then Blackwater rivers um, are very dark um, from the tannins released by, um, by leaf fall. Uh, from from plants, and in fact, just neither here nor there. But uh, where the Rio Negro and the Rio Amazon come together, and um, and then we name we name rivers. I don't actually know that there is an established. Uh, way that they get named. I assume it's like whatever seems bigger or more important. But anyway, once they come together, then the Negro just gets um, assimilated into the Amazon, but they literally run side by side for a while. And I was lucky enough to be there um, in, gosh, 2000 three, I guess. Um, and the Rio Negro is, as you would expect from the name of Blackwater River, the Rio Amazon, the Amazon is a whitewater river. And they literally, for like a couple of miles in Manaus, uh, the city in Brazil where uh, where this happens, where the confluence of the Negro and the Amazon happen, they just run side by side. There's nothing separating them but water chemistry and temperature. And then at some point you realize, oh, it's now, it's now just all one color, but it's extraordinary. Aqueous apartheid. I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to put an absolutely obnoxious spin on it. <laughs> um, but okay, so the fact is almost anywhere we go, if we do have any sort of a time series, mm -hmm. we get the same story, which is things are not going in a good direction. They are going so wrong so quickly that even, you know, it doesn't take a human lifespan to see the decline. Right. It takes less than a decade in many of these places. Right. And this happens. Uh, on so many different fronts. Now, I have to say, the thing one always has to be careful about if you're scientifically minded, and if you just simply want to know what the what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. is you've got to correct for the fact that it may be that you've heard horror stories about the world coming apart, and so you're sensitive to the stuff that you can no longer find where you were, mm -hmm. but you're not sensitive to the stuff you can find there now that wasn't there to begin with. Right, and so the idea is, yeah, there's ebb and flow, and maybe the, maybe what you're really seeing is dynamism, and you're just sensitive to the stuff that seems like it's gone, like loss aversion is causing you to misassess. Yep. And there are some stories, you know, when we were kids, bald eagle, that was like a mythical creature, right? Right. Now we didn't live in a place in, in Southern California. Bald eagles would would not have been common. I don't think they would have been present at all. Um, sure. However. Um, they wouldn't have been common up north either. And now we see them all the time. They're really common. Yeah. I mean, it. We, we know where a few areas are just right here within a couple of miles of our home in Portland. Yeah. If you're right. sensitive to them so that, you know, you're assessing every bird that flies over, if you can figure out what it is and you're looking for them, you'll see bald eagles. It's relatively common. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a direct result of our intervention, right, on their behalf. And there are many stories like that. Um, Northern elephant seals were nearly extinct. They're now. What did we do for them? Um, well, we protected their rookery, and I must be a hunting story involved there. It might actually just really be the the, the beach, the rookery, the, the beach. Yeah. Um, otters. Otters actually. Mm -hmm. Otters are sea otters. You're talking about. I'm talking about sea otters. Yeah. Sea otters were hunted. I think the population was below 80. Yeah. In the I world right. left Pacific mm -hmm. sea otter, mm -hmm. and it rebounded beautifully, and now it's on the decline again. Is it? Yeah. Oh, very much so. Mm -hmm. It's gotten much harder to see. Um, so anyway, these stories. You know, there are some positive stories. There's some mixed stories, but in general, the stories are all negative, and the degree to which when you and I started traveling to, you know, the Yucatan, for example, the degree to which you could go to a beach and it wasn't just covered in flotsam and jetsam, you know, it's not that there was none, mm -hmm. right? But uh, it, it has changed dramatically. The oceans were noticeably cleaner and you could tell that by uh, what was flung up out of them onto the coasts. Right. And if you think about the puzzle that this represents, like let's say, you know, A- And that would have been, that's 30 years ago. That's when we started traveling. So I would argue people have a right, right? That it's hard to define how the right works, but it's nobody's right to rob other people of the ability to emerge onto a beach and have it be natural, 
Mm -hmm. right? It's not your right to throw stuff into the sea somewhere that destroys somebody else's beach. And even people who live in these places, mm -hmm. they don't get the benefit of having their own coastline. You know, they may be impoverished and the one glory of their existence is that they happen to live in a beautiful place. And the point is even that will be robbed uh, from them. It's, 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 it's a tragic state of affairs. But if you think about what you would have to do, if you just recognized, yeah, actually we don't have the right to do that to anybody's beaches. Um, that means we have an obligation to control this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Well, then how would you even solve that? Because the question is you would have to be really good at capturing this stuff everywhere, right? At the point that it was no longer useful, it would have to be captured. And um, the problem is that would jack the price up. And mm -hmm. so the point is it's far easier to yep. ignore it. It's a and, classic. And some, and some products shouldn't be allowed, just as uh, the uh, the increase in bald eagles and other raptors it's, is largely attributable to the – um, to the regulation around DDT, yep. uh, right? Because DDT is now understood to thin eggshells and birds at the top of the bird food chain are likely to get the most of it and so bioaccumulate it. Um, there are likely to be other products, not chemical in nature, but you know, physical plastics and such, some kinds of products that actually shouldn't be made. Oh, many, many products that shouldn't be made and many products that should be made out of something else and many products that should have a built-in cycle so that it's made, but it is recaptured, mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of ways to address this, but the problem is people cannot wrap their mind out of, if you take as a given, we don't have the right to lose control of these things and have them emerge on somebody else's beach, right? then you have to construct the world differently and nobody's up for that level of regulation. And so it doesn't end up happening, which means that we're just living one giant tragedy of the commons. But even worse, mm -hmm. if you think about most people are not lucky enough to have the uh, kind of access to these remote places that we've had. Yes. When people get access, very often they get access in the context of, you know, well, I'd like to go to Mexico and, you know, here's a, here's a resort, mm -hmm. right? And the point is the resort will, of course, for its own selfish reasons, hire local people for presumably too little money to keep the beaches clean of this stuff, which will mm -hmm. falsely give the impression that this is a beautiful tropical beach and not that it is an exceptional beach that's the result of high vigilance, etc. And so people people get the wrong impression. And then because everybody wants to take, nobody wants to, I mean, you know, look, I'm a photographer. I was thinking about the trash this whole trip mm -hmm. and I was thinking I should be documenting this. And there was a part of me that just couldn't bring myself to do it. Mm -hmm. right? I couldn't make myself do it. I didn't want to accept that it was that real. And so I don't have those pictures, mm. right? Even though I, I, I felt obligated to take them, I just I didn't live up to my obligation. There's something very important here, and this is, this is a theme that we should come back to, uh, but something that I, I think you too, but I certainly used to always spend time in my teaching on around you know, the concept of ecotourism, where ecotourism appeals to people who think – that they care about nature and the environment and are making green decisions. And uh, I ended up, you know, quite by accident, sort of in deep with some ecotourism politics as a result of my very first field research, where you know this story, but um, I was we were we were in Costa Rica with four other graduate students and our professor for the summer, and he was basically doing a field course for us for the first five or six weeks, and then we were uh, to do our first research before um, presenting that as part of our qualifying exams to get to the next stage in graduate school. And I went down to Costa Rica with a hypothesis that I had generated in Madagascar around uh, monkeys preferring. Uh, fruit trees that have been cultivated and planted by humans to the wild fruits because monkeys would have similar aversions to secondary compounds as we do. I, I, had pretty, I was pretty pleased with it. I generated it by watching what crowned lemurs in Madagascar prefer tamarind, uh, which is an import from India, uh, to all of the local trees. And I, we were at this little tiny field station in Sarapiki, not La Selva, the big one, but a little tiny one called Silva Verde. Silva Verde? Uh, no, Silva Verde was the name of the ecotourist lodge. Yeah. Uh, it was called Bahuco. Bahuco. El yeah. Bahuco, meaning vine, right? Or liana. Anyway, yeah. um, we were at this field station, which is where we had decided that we would be doing our research, and I just couldn't find the monkeys. Couldn't find the monkeys at all. Uh, they weren't there, and I'd go out you know, every morning you know, with dawn, and at dawn, 
Don wasn't with us at the time. Uh, at Don. Also called in sick for work. <laughs> also called in sick for work. Couldn't take the humidity. And um, was out there for many hours every day, slogging through the mud and never found the monkeys. They were just MIA. But what I did happen upon were some poison dart frogs, which was my introduction to them. I had no previous experience with them. So I was called dart poison frogs. And it included a species that wasn't supposed to be there. That I didn't know that at first, but I started talking to you, know, you and the other graduate students and our professor, and it became clear. Like there's this one species I'm seeing, uh, what was then called Dendrobates auratus. It's still auratus, uh, which is a big black and green job, uh, which is you know much larger than the native Pomelio, uh, a little blue jeans frog with bright blue legs and a red back and sort of a um, and some dark dark um, arms. Uh, auratus, as it turns out had been introduced by this local ecotourist lodge. Why? Why would a place that is trying to attract tourists, mostly gringos from the US, to come and supposedly enjoy intact, undisturbed, lowland tropical rainforest, also known as jungle in Costa Rica, why would they introduce a species of frog? And they didn't introduce it from very far away. They introduced it from, I think, the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, if memory serves. Um, but it was bigger, it was brighter, well, easier to see than the native congener, than the native close relative. And you bring in a bigger version of the organism that's already there, and maybe it would work out. In this case, it didn't, though. And so my very first research ended up being documenting the way in which Aratus, the introduced by a supposed ecotourist lodge species, was actually driving extinct, locally extinct, uh, Pamelia, the blue jeans frog. And, you know, for why? For why? Who, you know, who, who wins as a result of that? A few American tourists, presumably, who had no idea what had been done on their behalf, presumably wouldn't have signed off for it, off on it if they had known, got access to another photo opportunity that they might not have had and saw a frog in a place that it had no business being. And that frog was responsible for driving a local species extinct. Okay. Let's be, let's be a little bit, um, let's be fair about this. There's a lot of stuff. So I agree with you. It's a, it's a tragedy that Aratus was introduced in Serapiki. Um, for one thing, we know exactly what it is that it drives out, right? It's a direct right. competitor for Pamelio, and mm -hmm. um, that makes it a, an obvious tragedy. If we take the situation on San Juan Island, mm -hmm. on San Juan Island, uh, San Juan Island has a couple of hazards to navigation that have lighthouses on them. Back before these were inhabited islands, the lighthouse keeper needed to tend the lighthouse in order that ships didn't get wrecked. In order to feed the lighthouse keeper, rabbits were released. This is a brilliant strategy if you think about it. You release rabbits and you hunt them as needed. Um, and the rabbits got they out of control. They stay fresh that way. <laughs> they do stay fresh that way. Rabbits got out of control, predictably enough. So foxes were brought in, right? Now the foxes are an utterly delightful feature of this landscape. And it's not obvious to me um, that the net impact of that sequence was terrible, right? It may be that the things, A, these were islands, they may have actually had empty niches because dispersal prevents certain things from getting to the island. So it may be that there's no huge downside in terms of some creature that was eliminated by either the rabbits or the foxes. I've never heard the analysis of what the rabbits displaced. Right. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know that it is known or if, if in fact it's possible they did not displace. Right. They anything. may not have. Yes. Right. There are just simply things missing from mm -hmm. these islands, which we know because even the islands don't have the same stuff on them. They have a, a grab bag of different critters. So just you didn't specify, although many people will be familiar, San Juan Island is the eponymous island in the San Juan archipelago, which is in the far northwest West corner of the continental of the lower 48 United, United States, part of the same archipelago that it in, continues into Canada, which are called the Gulf Islands, and which also includes the massive island that is Vancouver Island. Right. Um, and they are a lovely place. And I think foxes are only on San Juan Island. Um, I believe that's right. But in any case, the point is, you can be damn sure, biologically speaking, at least on the mainland, if you introduce a critter, it comes at a cost to other critters. It may drive them to extinction. It may compete with them in some way that uh, reduces, you know, reduces their niche size. It's not always a tragedy, but you're rolling the dice every time you do that. Mm -hmm.